You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hey, everybody, Rick here. You've all heard me blathering on this year about my latest book, Cybersecurity First Principles, A Reboot of Strategy and Tactics. Well, we've turned it into an on-demand course featuring me, yours truly, as the instructor. I highlight what I think are the follow-on strategies to pursue the absolute cybersecurity first principle, which is reduce the probability of material impact due to a cyber event in the next three to five years. The follow-on strategies include zero trust, automation, resilience, intrusion kill chain prevention, and risk forecasting. I think it's the perfect quick-hitting content for busy security leaders like you and me, and it's all available now. Check out www.n2k.com slash first principles course, all one word. That's www.n2k.com slash first principles course. Struggling to secure on-prem apps with modern identity? Don't worry, you're not alone. Join industry leaders from Fortune 500 organizations to secure your apps on any cloud with any IDP, regardless of your environment's complexity. Meet Strata's identity orchestration platform, Mavericks. Say goodbye to the headaches of app refactoring and legacy tech debt. With identity orchestration, you can modernize legacy apps to use MFA or passwordless authentication in a few weeks, migrate from one IDP to another, and so much more without changing the app. No matter your IAM use case, Strata extends the value of your current identity investments. And the best part? You can try it for free today. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire to share your biggest identity challenge, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. A quick look back at Patch Tuesday. Black Cat uses malicious Google ads. Social engineering in the third quarter of 2023. Are small businesses in denial about ransomware? Mole rats have some new tools. Israel turns to NSO Group's Pegasus to search for hostages taken by Hamas. Tim Starks from the Washington Post examines the potential aftermath of a Russian group hitting a Chinese bank. In our learning layer, Sam Meisenberg helps a student understand and create a strategy for the CISSP CAT. And a cyber espionage campaign is attributed to Russia's SVR. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire Intel briefing for Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. We begin today with a quick look back at yesterday's November Patch Tuesday. Microsoft addressed 58 vulnerabilities, including five zero days. Three of the zero days have been exploited in the wild. The two other zero days were publicly disclosed before patches were available, but Microsoft says it hasn't so far seen any evidence of exploitation. VMware addressed a critical authentication bypass vulnerability in VMware Cloud Director Appliance, Fortinet issued patches for several flaws affecting FortiClient and FortiGate, and SAP has received patches for six flaws, including an improper access control vulnerability with a CVSS score of 9.6 caused by the SAP Business One installation process. Researchers at eCentire warn that an ALFV Black Cat ransomware affiliate is using malware-laden Google ads to target entities in the Americas and Europe. They say this affiliate is taking out Google ads promoting popular software, such as Advanced IP Scanner, Slack, WinSCP, and Cisco AnyConnect, to lure business professionals to attacker-controlled websites. Thinking they're downloading legitimate software, 
the business professionals are actually downloading the Nitrogen malware. Nitrogen is initial access malware that leverages Python libraries for stealth. This foothold provides intruders with an initial entry into the target organization's IT environment. Kroll has published its Threat Landscape Report for the third quarter of 2023, finding that social engineering dominated the field last quarter. Kroll says, This was evidenced by our observations of the dramatic escalation of social engineering tactics with significant increases in phishing, smishing, valid accounts, voice phishing, and other tactics, adding up to the highest volume of incidents we've seen in 2023. Business email compromise attacks rose 13% in the third quarter compared to the previous quarter. Kroll's researchers write, The increasing volume of social engineering attacks is matched by a broadening range of approaches, whether that is via phone and SMS, as the group K2A243 Scattered Spider is known to abuse novel email phishing scams, or directly via Microsoft Teams using DarkGate malware. As part of the rise in social engineering, business email compromise continues to grow steadily in popularity, with both established and newer threat actors using a range of tactics to access data and, in some cases, ransom the information. A survey by Open Text Cybersecurity has found that a majority of small to medium-sized businesses, 65% in fact, don't believe they'll be targeted by ransomware attacks. Open Text says, Findings show a similarity in how small to medium sized businesses and enterprises think about ransomware attacks, including a disconnect about who is a target and growing concern about the use of artificial intelligence by threat actors. While the majority of organizations don't believe they will be attacked, they do understand the business risks as evidenced by increased security spending and plans to expand security teams. In spite of the security spending and their disinclination to believe that they'll be targeted by threat actors, 46% of SMBs and enterprises said they were hit by a ransomware attack in the past year. Proofpoint researchers yesterday described some new activity by TA-402, the Palestinian-aligned threat actor, better known as the Mole Rats, and sometimes called the Gaza Cyber Gang, Frankenstein, or Wirti. Between July and October, TA-402 has used a new downloader, IronWind, which they've used to install shellcode in victim systems. The group has also shifted away from using malicious Dropbox links and toward deploying XLL and RAR file attachments, presumably the better to evade detection. TA-402's targeting has continued to follow its historical pattern of prospecting Arabic-speaking governmental organizations in the Middle East and North Africa. It hasn't, so far, shown a shift toward direct support of the war between Hamas and Israel. Axios reports that Israeli authorities are said to be using NSO's Pegasus zero-click intercept tool to track cell phones belonging to hostages, murdered civilians, and Hamas terrorists in their effort to locate surviving hostages. NSO Group is said to be approaching U.S. officials to ask for a relaxation of strictures against its tools, which it argues have become vital to collection against terrorist organizations. There are, so far, few signs that the U.S. is moving towards such relaxation, imposed after many reports that Pegasus was widely abused by repressive governments. But there do appear to have been some approaches by European governments advocating for NSO Group's restoration to American good graces. Ukraine's National Cybersecurity Coordination Center, the NCSCC, has published its analysis of a widespread cyber espionage campaign that this past September hit diplomatic targets in Azerbaijan, Greece, Romania, and Italy. The foreign ministries of Azerbaijan and Italy were particularly hard hit. The campaign was widely regarded at the time as a Russian intelligence operation, and the NCSCC attributes it directly to APT-29, Cozy Bear, a unit of Russia's SVR Foreign Intelligence Service. The fish bait was familiar, a BMW, one owner, nicely loaded, for sale by owner, and so on, was offered for sale. The NCSCC gives the enemy service due props for intelligent social engineering, stating, 
APT-29 ingeniously employed benign-looking lures in the form of enticing BMW car sale photos and documents expertly crafted to draw in unsuspecting victims. And while the bait may have been old, the fish hook was new. The lure documents contained hidden malicious content that exploited the WinRAR vulnerability, granting attackers access to the compromised systems. The SVR also made creative use of the legitimate NGROC tool, which is used to provide temporary public URLs during web development and testing. In this case, it enabled them to communicate with infected targets in ways that can be difficult to detect. In this case, the intelligence goal seems only tangentially related to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, except insofar as trouble in the near abroad inevitably has repercussions for that war. The SVR appears to have been interested in Azerbaijan's intentions with respect to Nagorno-Karabakh, the province Azerbaijan has disputed with Armenia, and which Azerbaijan seized on September 19th and 20th of this year. Cozy Bear, Fancy Bear's less ostentatious cousin, has been implicated in several other high-profile incidents. These include both Russian intrusion into U.S. targets related to the 2016 U.S. elections and the 2020 supply chain attack against SolarWinds users. Coming up after the break, Tim Starks from the Washington Post examines the potential aftermath of a Russian group hitting a Chinese bank. In our learning layer, Sam Meisenberg helps a student understand and create a strategy for the CISSP CAT. Stay with us. There's nothing worse than relying on a legacy SIM that your security team has outgrown, especially when it impacts your ability to detect real incidents. Hunter's SOC platform offers built-in, always up-to-date detection rules and automatic correlation that allows SOC analysts to focus on higher-value tasks that impact your organization. It's time to move to a platform that reduces risk, complexity, and cost for the SOC. It's time to replace your SIM. Learn more by visiting hunters.security today. What's the true cost of a single cybersecurity incident? Try $4.3 million, and it's even higher in the United States. Each organization faces more than 1,200 cyber attacks per year. Tally that up and you're staring down some hefty losses. Getting ahead of these threats requires the right technology for tying cyber risk to business impact, so you can add context to any risk decision, prioritize remediation, and report what matters most to your key stakeholders. LogicGate's Risk Cloud Cyber Risk and Controls Compliance Solution makes all of that possible. Learn more at LogicGate.com. In the latest edition of our Learning Layers segment, N2K's Sam Meisenberg works with student Ethan Cook to understand and create a strategy for the CISSP CAT. Welcome to the Learning Layer. Uh, this is your host, Sam Meisenberg. And in this segment, you're going to be dropped into a continuation of a tutoring session. And uh, we have a student, Ethan, here who's studying, and he's a couple weeks away from a CSSP exam. So enjoy. And even if you're not studying for the CSSP, I still think you're going to get something out of it. So here we go. So how are you feeling? You're like a couple weeks away. Uh, I'm feeling good. The content okay. is definitely starting to stick in more, feeling nice. uh, well, doing a lot of the practice tests and like practice questions, answering a lot of them right. How have your scores been on the practice tests? Uh, I would say passing for most of them. Uh, you know, Passing what? <laughs> what do you mean by passing? Scoring Give like, me a percent. 
Uh, yeah, about like 78%, okay. 80%. Still okay. have room for, to improve, but sure. definitely uh, definitely passing. I think that's a pretty high score. I say, look, if, you are, if you're in the high 70s, low 80s, that's where you want to be. Because remember, a 70, 80% in your practice questions is not going to translate to like 80% on exam day because you're taking the cat, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like a whole different experience. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk about that a little bit mm -hmm. because I've studied for certification exams in the past. I mm -hmm. got my SAC plus nice. and uh, did well on those, but those are more traditional. And I've, you yeah. know, since starting this, heard a lot about the cat and how it's a very different experience and <laughs> it's very intimidating. And uh, I kind of have some anxiety about that. I was wondering if you could walk me through that a little bit. You, okay, so you're you're in the right place because I think what I want to assure you of is there's nothing to be afraid of. It's literally the same experience. It's just a multiple choice exam. It's just the format's a little bit different. So I can walk All you right. through that and kind of tell you what to expect. So do you know what the here's a here's a, I know you're tired of answering questions, but here's another question. Do you know what the A stands for in CAT? Uh, adaptive. Adaptive. Exactly. So all that means is the test is adapting to you as a test taker. So when you answer a question, right? Say you, you're on question number one. If you get that question correct, the next question it feeds you is going to be slightly harder. And then say you get that question right, the question after that, again, slightly harder. And then question number four, you get it wrong. The next question is slightly easier. All that means is it's taking your input from the previous question and your answer and then feeding you kind of the next question to get to your, like, knowledge and skill level. So that's what all we mean by adaptive. It's responding to you as the test taker. If you open the hood of a cat, what's happening is it's trying to get you to a level where you get every other question wrong. So what that means is on exam day, passing could mean getting, like, 55% of the questions correct. So when you are doing your practice questions now, life is good because you're getting 80% correct. On exam day, it's going to be a weird feeling because you could be doing well and being sort of on the route to passing, but getting like 55% of them right. So it's going to be a weird experience. You're going to feel like you're getting punched in the face every other question, but that's normal. So just walk in expecting that. Yeah, and I saw that like there's a range of questions, whereas mm -hmm. like, you know, with Sec Plus. It was a set number of questions. I forget off the top of my head how many it was, but... Well, sort I, of. Sec Plus is up to 90. Up to 90, So okay. you could see anywhere from like 85 to 90. But yes, point taken. Like, but with this one, I thought I think it was 125 to That's 175. Right. It's a pretty wide margin there. Right, exactly. So, and the interesting thing about that is, so the minimum, let's clarify those numbers. The minimum that you're going to see is 125. So you are definitely going to see 125 questions, at least no matter who you are on exam day. After 125, the test could end at any point. So what that means is, again, testing at question 1 and 25, whether you're above or below this thing called the passing threshold. And if you are above at 125, you pass. If you are below at 125, you fail. If you're straddling that passing threshold at 125, it keeps feeding you questions until you're clearly above or below. Now that sort of feeding those extra overtime questions can go all the way up to 175. So here's the important thing from a time management perspective. You need to anticipate seeing 175 questions. Yeah. You need to walk in there planning to see 175. Because imagine if you run out of time at question 150, well, then, then you're going to fail, right? Because then you basically, the, the machine doesn't have enough sort of data on you and it looks back at your last 50 questions and sees whether you're above or below the passing threshold. And if you're below at any point, then you fail. That's a long way of saying, I don't think the technical pieces matter. You're not going to pass if you run out of time. But it also, kind of on the same line of thought, if I'm at question 170, I'm still in the test. I'm still, because it would have failed me if I was too low already. So I should still treat those last questions with the same level of seriousness as question 126. So... You actually need to be more focused and more serious questions 126 to 175. What I mean by that is that think of it as like overtime in some senses because every question matters because there are 50 experimental questions on the CSSB. 50, that's a lot. Yeah. But they are all built into the first 125. Okay. So what that means is questions 126 to the end, there are no experimental questions. Everything matters. 
everything is going to affect your score and going above or below the passing threshold. So you need to be like uber focused. And then I know we've talked um, earlier about the time management piece. That's why you want to spend more time on those questions from 126 to 175, because those are the things that will make or break your score. Awesome. Thank you. That, that, that explanation really helps clarify the differences between a CAT and a traditional exam. So I know that it helped clarify, but how are you feeling? Are you feeling any less anxious? Uh, definitely less anxious. It's, I think it's always better to know what you're dealing with mm-hmm. than kind of sitting there in, 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 in ignorance. But uh, definitely would say the exam is still intimidating, but mm-hmm. I think that nothing's going to change that. I think I just kind of have to go and get it done with. That's right. And, and look, ultimately, too, I, I think you kind of hit the right balance. You don't want to be thinking about like how the cat operates on exam day. You don't want to be like, oh my gosh, this is an easy question. Does that mean I get a question wrong? Like, you're just going to psych yourself out and not focus on the content. And ultimately, it's an exam of whether you know your stuff or not. Time management is important. Test day strategy is important. Absolutely. But ultimately, the content, whether you know your stuff, that's the thing that's going to you know take you to the promised land. Yeah, content is king. Content is king. Go off, King. Now, one logistical note, this segment, we discussed the current four-hour version of the exam, which is 125 to 175 questions. But in April of 2024, the exam will be updated. It'll be a three-hour test that has 100 to 125 questions. Thank you for tuning into this segment of the learning layer. I hope you got something out of it. And if you yourself are studying for a certification exam and you have any questions about the content or test day strategy, please feel free to let me know by emailing learninglayer at n2k.com. This is Sam Meisenberg, and we'll see you next time on Learning Layer. Happy studying. That's N2K's Sam Meisenberg speaking with student Ethan Cook. And it is always my pleasure to welcome back to the show Tim Starks. He is the author of the Cybersecurity 202 at the Washington Post. Tim, welcome back. Hey there. Uh, I'm enjoying your recent reporting here on a uh, ransomware gang, uh, and perhaps they, they went a little bit too far by going after some folks in China. Can you lay out uh, your reporting here for us? Yeah, so um, the ransomware gang Lockbit, they managed to get a hold of uh, a, a U.S. division of, of the biggest bank in China, and actually the biggest lender by assets in the entire world. It's called the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, uh, the Financial Services Division, ICBC. We'll just call it for the rest of this talk. <laughs> um, so, uh, kind of, kind of a, a rare target to hit that, that that's this big. Also, a rare target to hit that's a Chinese state-owned organization. Obviously, the U.S. arm is a little different, but it's rare to see a Russian gang. Uh, as Lockbit is suspected of being, uh, go after a, a Chinese state-owned target. It's happened once, one other time this year with a with a newspaper that that China state owns. But that's a big difference between something that has billions of dollars worth of ass- worth of assets, and that might actually Im- impact people in China who are high up in the Communist Party. The, the sort of trigger for this was that was that uh, Chris Krebs, the the former CISA director, uh, had said on Twitter, "I think uh, I think." Lockbit's going to be going through some things. It's a funny way of saying. It's a funny way of saying that uh, they're in trouble, right? Yeah, uh, nice, nice understatement there. Yeah, I mean, he, and he was pointing to the way um, you know the U.S. started focusing in on. I believe it was was it Darkside or yeah, it was Darkside that that mm-hmm. did the Colonial Pipeline hack. You know that really energized the United States because suddenly, you know, a part a part of our economy was being affected and. In, in a way that was very much obvious to the to the pocketbook of the average person, even though the the fuel panic that that was caused by that was a little bit people's own fault, it still was a, a an indirect result of uh, that pipeline hack. So uh, I talked to a good number of people who uh, who were saying, "Yeah, this is going to be bad for them." Not sure what they were thinking. Yeah, I mean, is is it possible that this was an affiliate or that they weren't aware of who they were hitting? What do you think? Exactly right. Um, that is one of the possibilities. Uh, you know, Alan Liska from Recorded Future brought up to me. Also, echoed in another of the comments that's in the story. 
it seems as though Lockbit does not have much quality control on who they decide to tag team with. They seem to be just sort of like, whoever wants to pay for, the, for our malware can have it, and now you're an affiliate. And then, you know, once, once it's out there, Lockbit, the Lockbit name is on it. Um, they can't you know, necessarily say, not our fault, it's an affiliate. Well, you're still directly connected to who did it. So um, that is one theory about what happened. Affiliates are going to be maybe more indiscriminate about who they go after. First off, ransomware is often a, an indiscriminate thing anyway. But, but there is a, there's a sort of catch and release thing that can happen, right? right? You know, like, oh, we caught a big fish. We do not want this, we do not want this shark on our board. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Here, here, here is your uh, key to unlock everything that we inadvertently locked. Exactly. Please, yeah, please yeah, carry that's on. The, that's, the, that's the release part. Here you go, shark. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> go right. on back into the ocean. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think in this case, you know, I, whoever, whoever did this decided to pursue it. And, and if, the, if their gang is to be believed, and of course we, we can't always trust what the ransomware gangs claim. Uh, they are, after all, criminals who live for a living. They say ICBC paid. Um, so they, if they did pay, it was probably a pretty decent fee. I mean, uh, you know, this, this caused some trouble for the treasuries markets and, 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 and to, to, to see some orders reporting on it, you know, it, it almost caused some real problems for the bank overall because of the assets they have and who they work with. So it, it, it really was, uh, there was really a, a serious incentive for them to pay if they did in fact pay. Any speculation on how this may play out from here? I mean, do, do we expect Lockbit to get a slap on the wrist, or might they be looking at a shutdown? Yeah, it's not. You know, if you, I think, if you look back to what happened with Colonial Pipeline, um, and the U.S. went after them, got their, got some of the assets back, uh, got some of the stolen money back. That is, I guess, the, the ransom payment back. It wasn't long after that that Darkside kind of folded and, and rebranded or, or dispersed. That's certainly a possibility. China might decide to extract some pain. I believe one of the quotes from one of the people I spoke to was, mm. uh, extract some pain from Lockbit directly. Or it could be a situation where Russia um, you know, says, hey, we've been kind of protecting you. Now, you're on your own. Or they might help China you know, go after these guys. Uh, if, if you'll recall, there was a, a brief moment um, before the Ukraine war where um, the US and Russia were working together to go after a ransomware gang it was Revel uh, or mm, Revel, depending mm-hmm. on who you talk to, where they actually helped helped go after some members and arrested them. If the PR videos and, and the actual appearance in court courts were to be believed, now how sincere that effort was by Russia, you know, there was a lot of speculation at the time that this was a, a weird kind of diplomacy to to say, hey, we'll help you on these ransomware gangs if you leave us alone when we go after Ukraine. Um, and not not a lot has necessarily come of that since. Uh, there have been some drop charges. There's been some circulation of. Maybe some of these people are still going through the court systems. It's a little opaque over there in Russia. Yeah. Uh, so it's possible that Russia just does something like that to, to signal to China that, hey, we're not going to let them do this to you. And then that yeah. could also send a signal to uh, other people that, that uh, no, no, you're not allowed to go after China. They are not, maybe they're not an ally, but they're close enough that we would prefer <laughs> that you don't go after them. Right. I, I would love to be a, a fly on the wall with some of the, the diplomatic communiques between the, the Chinese folks and the Russians saying, hey, what's going on here, friend? <laughs> if you yeah. get a hold of it, please, if you get a hold of those, com- com- those, uh, d- those cables, please, please put them on air. Uh, and, <laughs> we'll and read do. The, read, the, read them all. Like, just make a whole session out of your, out of your podcast that day. Like, here's there everything they said. Ah! Right, right. Lots, lots of screaming and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> All right. Well, Tim Starks is the author of the Cybersecurity 202 at the Washington Post. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. 
We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by our editorial staff. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Tomorrow. 